ERAS stands for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. So let's jump right into it. At their website, they have 32 guidelines right now that are available for use and for your review. So I highly recommend that you go to the ERAS Society website and look at those guidelines. It is a wealth of knowledge that is evidence based. If you would like to learn more about the ERAS uh, protocols, you can also go to their YouTube channel and watch videos about their uh, evidence-based practice. And then they also have a TED talk as well. So lots of resources to jump right into ERAS guidelines. Now let's look at those guidelines. They are absolutely based on evidence. Uh, the history of ERAS uh, goes back to the 1990s when they were looking at fast tracking surgery. That has evolved into the ERAS guidelines. In 2010, the ERAS Society was formed. And then in 2017, the first US trained facility took place in Charlotte, North Carolina. You can see this is a fairly new evidence-based practice that is being applied to perioperative services at every phase of the care. And now we're just gonna skim over these guidelines. Enhanced recovery after surgery has been shown to improve clinical outcomes, decrease costs, decrease length of stay, improve patient satisfaction, and decrease the use of opioids. So enhanced recovery after surgery uses several different techniques in the guidelines to improve those outcomes. The ones that we're going to talk about today are the multimodal analgesia uh, in the pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. Then we will also talk about opioid sparing techniques and what that is. Uh, regional anesthesia I will cover in the next video. And then post-op opioid sparing I will also cover briefly in this video and then also more when we talk about opioids which is uh, going to come after blocks in this pain series. And then the last part of our pain series will be covering non-pharmacological interventions. These guidelines are very comprehensive. They have been put together by a mass group of phenomenal physicians across the world, and they have looked at the literature and then they've made their recommendations based on the evidence. So really exciting times. And I definitely challenge uh, your unit practice committees to jump into the ERAS protocols if you don't already have one going on. Uh, what can we expect from the multimodal analgesia aspect of the ERAS guidelines? And first part of that guideline, we are going to be looking at Tylenol. It's an antipyritic, but it doesn't have anti-inflammatory properties. So what you're going to see is your patients getting a gram of Tylenol, usually orally in the pre-op phase, two pills with a small sip of water right before surgery. Um, this has been shown to decrease the need of opioids in the post-op phase. And um, just remember with Tylenol that it is metabolized by the liver and we do have a daily max dose on that, which is three grams for the day. Avoid Tylenol if you have somebody who is an alcoholic and has liver failure because it can cause hepatotoxicity. And then also remember acetylcysteine is antidote for a Tylenol overdose. We shouldn't see that in this scenario. That's usually something you see in the ER, but just to refresh your memory. You want a, a safe daily max dose of Tylenol is three grams a day. So just remember that when you're teaching your patients um, because some of them may get a prescription of hydrocodone which is oxy with Tylenol. And we wanna make sure we stay within that three gram limit for the day. Now, our next multimodal analgesia is going to be our wonderful NSAIDs. This is your ibuprofen. This is your Toradol. And so the way the NSAIDs work is by decreasing inflammation and that inflammatory soup. So they block the COX um, enzymes, which then blocks prostaglandins and prostaglandins um, are the stress response. And that causes the whole inflammatory process to kick in. So that is how the NSAIDs work. Um, COX-1 is found on platelets and GI mucosal cells, and then the renal tubules. And then COX-2 is found in the fibroblasts, uh, the chondrocytes, the endothelial cells, and the macrophages. So Toradol is our only IV form of NSAIDs. 
and usually you will see a dose anywhere from 15 milligrams to 30 milligrams. I usually see 15 milligrams most. Um, if anesthesia chooses to do this uh, medication, it needs to be cleared by the surgeon. And you definitely would want to avoid giving Toradol to your um, bariatric patients, um, your GI bleed patients, your colorectal patients, um, because of the GI mucosal or COX-1, it can cause increased GI bleeding. So we want to avoid it in that patient population. It can cause um, leaky anamostasis. And that is definitely something that we want to avoid in our um, bariatric and GI patient population. Now, the other NSAID that you are going to see, and you're going to see it primarily in the pre-op phase, is Celebrex, 200 milligrams PO with a small sip of water. And this is the only NSAID that is a COX-2 selective NSAID. But I will remind you, it has a black box warning for MI and stroke. So if you have a patient who is a high-risk cardiac patient, you'll want to have a conversation with anesthesia and the surgeon before actually giving that medication, just to clarify that. Post-op, you're going to see ibuprofen, usually 800 milligrams, ordered um, every six hours, and they're going to rotate it with Tylenol. You will just confirm that with your surgeon, but that's usually the route that I have seen ordered in the um, phase two phase or in the inpatient phase once they have left the recovery room. Remember, with your NSAIDs, it's contraindicated in GI surgery, renal surgery, bariatrics, ulcers, and GI bleeds. Now, our next multimodal is a anticonvulsant. It's called gabapentin or neuromptin. And you will usually see 600 milligrams PO in the pre-op area with small sips of water. And this has been shown to manage nerve pain by blocking neurotransmitters. Um, it's also used for epilepsy. Um, the one thing that you do want to note with your patients is when they're in the PACU, um, it can add to drowsiness and sleepiness if they had it in pre-op. So just take that into consideration. And I have seen that in the clinical practice, definitely with gabapentin. But I think that you're going to see this um, ordered more with many different kinds of surgeries from lumbar surgery to orthopedic surgery, to colorectal surgery, to uh, robotics, to um, GYN, GU surgery. So take note of that. It has been shown to decrease opioid use in the PACU in the phase one and phase two area. Now, the next multimodal that we're going to be looking at is Pepsid, and I have seen this ordered in the pre-op area, 20 milligrams PO with a small sips of water. And so you can see we're usually giving our patients quite a bit of pills in the pre-op phase with some small sips of water between the Neurontin, the Tylenol, the Pepsid, and the Celebrex but this blocks histamine, which is triggered with the nociceptive response um, of surgery. And it's to decrease that inflammatory response, that um, inflammatory soup that I talked about when we reviewed the pain pathophysiology. And if you didn't get a chance to watch that video, I would recommend that you go back and just review it. It's a quick, uh, short, brief overview of pathophysiology of pain, uh, nociceptive, neuropathic, and mixed pain. And I have a slide here just for your refresher. <laughs> Remember, uh, pain is stimulated by transduction. That's the first imp uh, input. And that is usually from the surgical input of the cut. And it is uh, triggering those afferent neurons and the nociceptors. And it's releasing serotonin, bradykinin, histamine, substance P, and prostaglandins. So you can see where our multimodal analgesia is immediately working right here on the first phase of uh, pain response at the transduction phase. Let's just review our enhanced recovery after surgery guidelines and the multimodal aspect of these guidelines. So in the pre-op phase, you can expect your patient to get Tylenol, Gabapentin, Celebrex, and Pepsid. Then in the intra-op page, you can expect your patient to possibly have um, Presidex infusion, an IV lidocaine drip, an IV magnesium drip, and local anesthesia. Then um, they could also have a total IV anesthesia, which is Presidex. Presidex has analgesic properties to it.
then in the post-op phase, you are going to see your NSAID. You'll see toward all given. You know, I didn't read about the muscle relaxants for our back surgeries on the ERAS protocols, but I have found this to be very effective over opiates with our multi-level lumbar fusions is Robaxin, a muscle relaxant. So I would um, just put that in for consideration, have a conversation with your anesthesiologist, with your surgeon, if you're a patient, if you've given them narcotics and they still are in a lot of pain post-op, you might wanna um, just suggest a muscle relaxant like Robaxim methocarbonyl. With your GU patient population, um, our renal cystoscopies and ureteral stunts, pyridium goes a long way for these patients to decrease the urgency with those cystoscopes. So just consider that it will um, you can hit them with a bunch of opioids and they're still going to have irritation and urgency and pyridium or um, levsin will help with this patient population. And then in your OBGYN patient population the, with the vaginal packing, um, the, the hysterectomies, they can benefit from a belladonna opium suppository. And that will take away that pressure and that constant feeling of like they need to have a bowel movement because of all the pressure down below from the surgery and the packing. So just um, something to consider with that patient population. Ice and cold therapy, uh, regional blocks by anesthesia. Um, last layer opioids and our PCA. Now in the discharge, you're going to see NSAIDs um, ordered over the counter, Tylenol over the counter and minimizing your opioids and then good old ice therapy. So this sums up the portion of our video on enhanced recovery after surgery and multimodal analgesia. Now don't forget to check in next week where we're gonna talk about local anesthesia, regional anesthesia, and neuroaxial anesthesia. Stay tuned, I'm excited to share this with you. If you are doing these things, I'd love to hear about it. I also would like to hear about if you have any um, ERAS uh, coordinators working in your hospital, um, implementing these things, doing the education with the staff. Uh, that is something that has been um, crucial with the implementation of this program over uh, overseas. And it's not just in the UK. This is something that is global because the evidence is so strong. We all should be doing this. So I hope this helps shed some light on this wonderful evidence-based practice and how we can improve our patients' outcomes, improve their satisfaction, and minimize any complications and get them one step closer to home. Thank you for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kathy.